Locking rows is something the database should do. Obviously, the example here is your most classic example. I've got two people trying to delete the same row. Only one should win, the other one should wait. That's stock standard locking. That's not what we're talking about in this particular demo. Other people would think, well, at the next level up is locking what we call across tables, which is here I have someone trying to delete from the department table, and I'm also trying to update the employee table. If those two tables are linked by a foreign key, then once again, correctly, we want to make sure we do some enqueuing and some locking in there to make sure that we're actually controlling the concept of locking. Once again, I'm not referring to this particular example. This was the claim that came in from an Ask Tom user. I'm doing a delete on the same table, two different sets of rows. There's nothing special about the table. It's not an IoT, it's not part of a cluster, etc. Trying to do a delete, two different sets of rows, and it's blocked. And the question is, how could this possibly happen? We dug around a bit and we actually came to the resolution and it actually wasn't too hard, but I thought I'd explain it in this office hour session. They said to us, the really strange thing is it's not happening all the time. That was the strange thing. To do this, I'm gonna to have to get a few sessions going. I'm gonna create a table called T and I'm gonna insert a thousand rows into this table called T and commit. And I'm gonna update a row where the primary key equals 10. And now I've got some prompts in here to tell me to go to session number two. So session none has updated primary key number 10. This is session two. He's updating primary key number 11. And as you'd expect, that works just fine. And then we go over to session number three. He's updating the primary key for number 12 and it works fine as well. So as you can see, session one, primary key 10, session two, primary key 11, session three, primary key 12, and it all works fine. So that's normal operation, nothing wrong there. So I'm gonna roll back that one and go back to session two, roll back him and go back to session one and roll back him and we're back to a starting state. Let's repeat the demo now, but let's make it a tad more realistic. I create my table called T. I insert some data and then stuff happens. I'm doing some updates. In fact, I've actually updated some rows here between primary key one and 17. I've done some you know, operations. This table is now fluid and having stuff happening to it. So I update T, I update for primary key 10 and it says go to session two. Update primary key 11, that works. And then it says go to session three. I go to session three. I try update primary key number 12 and I didn't get my one row updated sign. That's not so good, is it? Those rows, you know, there's no triggers on this table. There's no magic here effectively. I've got a blocking lock here, but I'm not trying to tack the same rows in any way, shape or form. So what's going on? The first time we ran that through, we didn't have any problems. The second time we ran it through, we did have some locking problems. It wasn't happening all the time. It's actually relatively easy to explain. And so here's my picture of a database block as many people think about it. And that is an empty block. And as I put rows into it, they slowly fill up the block. And as most people are aware, we stop. We don't actually come to a point where we simply say, yep, let's just fill the thing right up. We stop at a point and what's that point? It's defined by percent free. And the reason we have percent free is because if someone comes along later and updates rows and those rows no longer fit back in where they were, they've made a row larger, they've increased the size of one of the columns, we have some space into which we can grow that particular row without having to move it to another block. So most people are very familiar with the percent free concept and how it works. It's a bad diagram though, even though I drew it in PowerPoint, because this is not all that happens in terms of what's actually on a block. Inside a block as well is a thing called the block header. And inside the block header is these things called transaction slots. And they comprise, they in total, a thing called the interested transaction list. We need to track what is happening on these blocks. So when we grow a row for an update and it fills up the rest of the space in these blocks, then I've still got these transaction slots there, but I no longer have space for more than two of them, as in this case, in the diagram shows here. So the first delete comes along or an update, anything which requires to do a transaction and says, yep, I want to start a transaction. We grab one of those transaction slots in the interested transaction list and says, yes, you are now allowed to conduct a transaction on me, my block. A second session comes along, he gets given a transaction slot as well. Now, normally, if a third session comes along, he would be given a third transaction slot. Now, if that didn't exist, we would simply claim some of the free space in the block to actually have a third slot. 
But as you can see here, because a row has grown or several rows have grown to fill up all that free space, I can't actually allocate a third slot. There isn't simply enough space in the block. So what happens is I don't get that third slot. And what happens? Our third transaction, as we saw in our demo, it's forced to wait. He simply can't get access to a transaction slot, which means he isn't allowed to commence his transaction. And as we saw before, when one of the other transactions roll back, or in fact, they could have committed, it wouldn't have mattered, that will free up one of those two transaction slots and the third guy is allowed to then proceed. A, a lack of capacity to allocate a transaction in a block can also be a blocking lock. What that does mean is, I use a bit of an artificial example here. I, took, I sort of glossed over it in the demo, but we actually took a lot of the columns and made them a lot larger in the second time through to consume all of our space. The most common time you see this, I find, is when people, and don't get me wrong, are correctly using percent free lower than the default of 10. And when I say correctly is the vast majority of databases I ever see in the world have percent free 10 on every single table. And yet you ask these people, how often do you update the rows? They go, never. How often do you delete? Oh, occasionally. How often do you insert? All the time. Percent free 10 is generally a bad idea for the vast majority of tables. But for those tables where you are going to grow into that free space, then you might want to choose your percent free judiciously such that you don't run out of ITLs. Or when you build those tables, if you are expecting a lot of concurrency on them, you can actually nominate your init trans parameter um, because it defaults to two.